So today we're going to look at the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. So what I would like you to do is pause the screen and have a think about everything we've learnt this term already and tell me what do you already know about the Tudor period. So being a monarch, a king or queen in Tudor times, had its advantages and its disadvantages. So as a ruler, so king or queen, you were in complete control. You had absolute power over the laws and the rules and any decisions that were made for your country. And it was important that people obeyed all of those rules. So you had complete control. Now, it was also important to produce an heir, usually a son, to the throne because it was crucial for the family bloodline to be continued and be able to rule. So in Tudor times, boys were seen as much more important than girls, and every Tudor monarch then wanted a son to be able to continue the Tudor bloodline. We know this proved to be quite a challenge for Henry VIII. Now, the only other problem was that you were always in danger of someone trying to overthrow you, so for someone to take you off the throne. Now, somewhere, someone always thought that somebody else would be better than you. We know that this was such a big issue when we look at the Battle of the Roses, so the War of the Roses, and that 100-year period where that throne was constantly changed from one ruler to another to another because nobody could agree on who was going to be the best ruler for the country. So here is a family tree. Okay, We know that the Tudors reigned from 1485 to 1603. Now, let's test your knowledge. Pause the screen. How many Tudor monarchs can you see on this family tree? Okay, let's see if you were right. So there were indeed five Tudor monarchs, okay? So the Tudor family came into power in 1485 when Henry Tudor became king. This was when he managed to overthrow King Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth. So Henry Tudor was then known as Henry VII, and he became the very first Tudor king for the Tudor dynasty. And he reigned for 24 years, from 1814-85 to 1509. Now, Henry VIII, who was Henry VII's son, was seen by many as the most famous Tudor king. Okay, now he ruled for 38 years and during his reign, we already know, he married, not once, not twice, but six times. Within those six marriages, he had three children who in turn all eventually became monarchs of England. So we had Edward VI, who reigned from 1547 to 1553. Then we had Mary I, who was 1553 to 1558. And then our last Tudor monarch was Elizabeth I, and she reigned from 1558 to 1603. So she ended up being the longest reigning monarch between the three children. Now, have a pause and have a think. Do you know why Henry VIII married so many times? Think about the wives that he divorced. Think about the annulments that he had. Think about the reasons that he beheaded some of his wives. Have a think. How can you see how many times he'd married and why? So, here is a portrait, and there's two clues, okay? This woman reigned from 1558 to 1603. Let's see if you've remembered that from the slide before. And her parents were King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. So, which of Henry VIII's three children do you think that portrait is? Pause the video and have a think. So this is actually a portrait of Queen Elizabeth I. Now she was the last reigning Tudor monarch for England, okay? So she was born in 1533. Now her father, Henry VIII, had been hoping for a boy, as he had with all of his previous marriages. However, he was bitterly disappointed when she was born, okay? To the point where she didn't even attend her christening. Now her mother, Anne Boleyn, if we remember the order, she was executed, she was beheaded, okay? And actually, Henry VIII did the execution. So she was executed by her father when Elizabeth was just three years old. Now, as a result of this, he then went and required an annulment from his marriage from Anne Boleyn, which in turn meant that Elizabeth became what we call an illegitimate child. So she effectively was a child from a ma from two parents who were then not lawfully married. And as a result, she was then actually removed from the line of succession to become queen of the throne. This was later then rectified by parliament and was changed. But at that point in time, she was then no longer in line for the throne due to the annulment of her parents' marriage. Now, despite her chaotic life, she grew up to be a very intelligent person. She was deemed as a very clever young woman. She was very well educated and she was very fluent in several languages, including French, Italian and Latin. 
Now we know when we looked at some of his wives in a previous lesson, we know that she excelled and she was very good at music, but she was also very accomplished with mathematics and astronomy. Now after her father's death, uh, death she lived with his last wife, who was Catherine Parr for a while, so we remember that she effectively took on the stepmother role for her before she died. Now this is a portrait of Elizabeth, this is her as a young princess, and it, this is her at only 13 years old. Now before she died, I want you to have a think, how might she have felt towards her father given his previous behaviour and why? So in 1553, Mary Tudor, who was Elizabeth's half-sister and also the daughter of Catherine, uh, Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, she became queen. Now at first, the two sisters were on good terms. However, in 1554, Elizabeth was implicated in a plot to overthrow Mary. And as a result, Mary had her imprisoned in the Tower of London, which was the same place, if you remember, was where her mother Anne Boleyn had been held before her execution in 1536. Now, this was one of the challenges that Elizabeth actually had to overcome due before and after her reign as queen. Now, because she was put into this plot, this became a challenge for them in terms of their relationship, which meant they no longer got on very well as sisters. So I want you to have a pause and think, how do you think Elizabeth felt at this time? And what might she have thought was going to happen to her? Thinking about what the Tower of London was infamous, infamously known for in the Tudor times. So Elizabeth had written letters at the time to show that she was truly terrified of what the outcome might be of this plot that she was supposedly involved in. And she was convinced that she was going to be executed because at that point in time, it was a very common punishment for high treason, which is to go against the crown or the monarch of the country. Now in total, she was in the Tower of London for two months and she was eventually released as there was no evidence to prove that she was involved in this plot to overthrow and execute her sister. Instead, she was then sent to Oxfordshire, where she was then put under house arrest. Now, this is a picture of the Tower of London. Okay, this is now currently a very popular tourist attraction in London. I want you to pause and just have a think. Do you think Elizabeth felt that she was in any danger, and why? Now, while she was under house arrest, Queen Mary I, who was a very strict Catholic, wanted to return the country of England to its faith. So this is going back on what her father had done and Edward VI had done previously during their reign. So during her father's reign, the number of people following the Protestant faith had grown because obviously he had split away from the Catholic Church and he had then developed the Church of England. Now, although both branches of the Christian faith were still significant, they had significant beliefs. However, there were some significant differences within the beliefs that the two sides actually argued about. So from the Protestant's faith, a church could be undecorated and plain. Services should be in English so that everyone was able to understand what was being said. And everyone should be able to read the Bible for themselves. Now we know that speaking English was not very common in those days, but equally they found it easier to translate it from English into English than from Latin, which is what came from the Catholic Church. So in the Catholic Church, the churches were much more highly decorated and this was to reflect God's glory. Services there were also continued in Latin. So Latin was what was changed when the Protestant faith came about and the Bible was only supposed to be read by the priests. 